there from Greenies. We welcome in James Ham joining me and Kyle Matson here on ESPN 1320. If you're watching on Twitch and YouTube, you know we've been going over random uh, uh, exposed players because of the hat that uh, uh, Kyle Matson is wearing today. And, it, and I'm actually glad that that's how this is starting, James, because I pointed out something, and I'm sure you saw it earlier. SB Nation put out an article about the top summer league players from this year. And they neglected to include the guy who won the co summer league MVP in Davion Mitchell. And then they put an amendment out there like, Oh, we've, we've updated the article and we've put Davion Mitchell as an honorable mention. And I made it a point that if you're following the Sacramento Kings and you want to know about your Kings players, you need to follow guys like James Ham. You need to follow guys like Jason Jones. You need to follow guys who actually watch games to write about players because what those guys at SB Nation were clearly doing were looking at box scores, watching different highlights on social media or watching highlights on Twitter. And you just exemplified how much you know, not only because you've 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 shown off your basketball knowledge for years. No one has questions about that. But now you're naming random Expo players and, and fantasy football draft picks at number one, all within a span of like three minutes. And this group that gets paid to cover basketball left out the guy who won the MVP of the summer league until after he won the MVP, he left them off of their uh, top players of summer league list. Yeah. You know, and I also forgot to mention Tim Raines. Um, <laughs> no, <that's> great one. <laughs> Thanks, James. Underrated. Random, Thanks, James. <laughs> random exposed players that we were discussing earlier. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, look, I, I mean, when it comes down to it, I, uh, Davion Mitchell is going to be one of those players that his impact on a game transcends the box score. There's nothing you can do about it. There will be nights where he really does nothing and he does everything at the same time. And so I think it's interesting that, um, that someone would omit the guy who literally just led a team as, as a rookie led a team all the way to the championship uh, and, and then won the MVP um, but at the same time, you know, it's, it goes back to sort of the old, uh, Tom Glavin baseball commercial, right? The chicks dig the long ball. Um, you know, I, I even remember something about, uh, Matt Harpering had done an interview and he said, look, like I did all of the dirty work for so many years in the NBA. And then I knew I had a contract year coming up and I said, you know what, I'm just going to show people that I can score too. I just don't need to, to be good. And to be impactful. And I think he averaged like 17 and a half points. He got paid for 17 and a half points. And then he went back to being the player he was before, which was a highly impactful, effective player. And so I think Davion is going to be one of those guys, you know, uh, if you missed it, he shot 47% from three. Like he did so many, uh, his assist to over ratio was like 5.8 to like 1.6. Like these are things that like winners do. His team didn't lose. They shut everybody down. The Sacramento Kings averaged 19, what was it? They had 19 steals in the I, the final game, but they averaged 14 steals a game over the five-game stretch. Mm. And he only had one steal a game. What he does is he gets into the guy with the ball, and that makes mistakes, and everybody else feeds off of it. I mean, I think Lou King and who is the other guy that uh, last night, um, the pogo stick, who they both had, uh, Emmanuel. Um, Emmanuel Terry. Yeah, Emmanuel Terry. Both had five steals last night. Mm -hmm. Those aren't just them reaching in and popping balls away. Those are, you know, guys like Peyton Pritchard throwing bad balls because they're being blanketed. And so, yeah, this is a, it, he's going to be interesting. He's going to be interesting to cover because, you know, winning the rookie of the year is going to be extremely difficult with this draft class. But, what happens if the Kings improve by 12 games or something, something wild and crazy. And a lot of it is because of his defense. So we're going to have to wait and see. But is he even going to be in the rookie of the year conversation talking about Davion Mitchell, if he's scoring nine and a half points a night? No, I mean, I, I don't think he will, but you know, again, if the Sacramento Kings are the six seed in the, in the West, then yes, you know, it, he'll have to be because it won't matter how good King I think Malcolm can. Brogdon did. Yeah, there, I don't think there are how, some some circumstances behind it, but but that wasn't a great draft. I mean, Malcolm Brogdon was the best player, and he was taking the second round in that draft. You know, it, as far as that first year, you know, it's kind of like the year that Mike Miller won Rookie of the Year. Just wasn't a great overall. You know, there wasn't a lot of great quality draft picks that that did much. And, and then when again, if you're looking at Davion, I mean, 
we don't know what he's going to do. We don't because mm -hmm. what we saw at summer league was a player who was a primary focus player on the offensive end. Everyone tried to take away a lot of things from him because he was the guy who was distributing. He's the guy who's setting everybody up. Just think of him as, I don't know, a fourth or a fifth option. It's going to be crazy. And think of him with a lob threat like Rashawn Holmes, as opposed to some of the guys that he, he played with in, in summer league. Like there's a lot of things you can see where he can show improvement just because the skill around him is better. Where's Louis? Give me, give me some news on Louis the King, man. I, I really like him. I like him dating back to last year. And I know we've talked about him before and it's just the place is hard for him. Like finding room for him. But I really do think he's a good ball player. Um, yeah. Will he I, get minutes? Do you think he can get minutes? You know, I think he can. I mean, look, with the the new NBA rules right this year, I think you can you can suit up all fifteen players that that you well you can suit up up to fifteen, mm -hmm. as opposed to it's usually you can only suit up thirteen and you have two guys that are are floaters. Um, this year, I believe you can suit up all fifteen. He can be with the parent club for up to he can be active for up to fifty games during the regular. season. Did we do we lose ham? That's never happened before. It's because he has never, beef with me. It's, it's never happened. We 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 James Ham froze. That has literally never ever happened in all of these years. Or it's years. In the you, last year, we've never lost it. He's um, and he's just frozen like I, on the screen. Look at oh he, and like we, we've even we oh boy. <laughs> James. was really surprised. Do we have problems for a sec? <laughs> I love that you were committed to the answer and have no idea that we actually lost you there for a moment. I don't know. How long did, did we, we lose? You? How long did you lose me? <laughs> Through the bulk of the answer, we even got we even got the technical difficulty sign coming from your screen. We've never seen that before. Okay, it's well, a, I'll, a, I'll just I'll start again. Like, look, it's I, a I tough day cool... at the ham house. Please start, I, start again. You the ham has thought out. Go ahead. Yeah, there we go. There we go. All right. So I, I was just saying that. Um, so for me, like, look, the fact that he can play for up to 50 games with the parent club mm -hmm. is huge. Like it used to be that the two way players could only be there uh, between practices and games 45 days. Now practices don't count. You can be up there for up to 50 games. Um, I, so I think that's a good thing. I think that um, the fact that he also, um, he plays a position that really the Kings need desperately. That's a good thing for him. Um, I think that the fact that Robert Woodard really didn't play well at all, and I don't know what's happened to him, but he looked heavy footed. He couldn't keep up with anyone on the defensive end. He looked like either he was, he was literally heavy or just had bulked up so much. And then I'm not sure what was going on with his three point shot. Like that was some Omri Caspi, you know, scraping the ceiling, scraping the bottom of the scoreboard stuff. And it wasn't even close. Like I, Robert Woodard had a disaster of a summer league for a team that really, really played well. So I don't think anything is guaranteed. And if I look at, uh, look around and I, and I see, you know, again, a guy like Emmanuel Terry, well, man, I would love to have Emmanuel Terry on a two-way contract, you know, two-way contracts. Now they pay $400,000 a year. Um, guys can bounce back and forth. We did. I forgot to mention, I did mention it, but we lost me. Um, <laughs> that, uh, they're also this season. You can suit up up to 15 guys, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. So it used to be, you could only suit up 13 and then two guys had to be marked as, you know, out each and every night. Now you can suit up up to 15. So that's a good deal as well for, for a guy like Luke King. Um, so I think there's going to be lots of times where he can actually be there and be on the court and, and all that stuff. Um, but look, he shot really well. He played defense really well, which has always been a knock on him that he he doesn't have a consistent effort and he doesn't play, he doesn't lock in and actually try on the defensive end. Um, to me, he looked just like body mechanics. We talked last week about Andre Blatch uh, mm. and sort of the Nemeas uh, Keda, you know, comparison. But he he moves a lot like Latrell Sprewell to me. You know, he has a lot of that sort of Latrell Sprewell game in him. And if he can lock in, I think that there's potential here. I think there's potential for him to not only like somehow dislodge Robert Woodard from a roster spot and have, you know, that roster spot go to him and a guy like Emmanuel Terry get, make a two-way contract. There's a lot of things that can happen on the end of a bench. 
um, that I just think that, you know, we're going to have to wait and see. And so I, I like competition and I think he's brought it. And the fact that he's locked up on a two way, no matter what is a really good thing for the Kings. How many, how, how much stock are the Kings putting into summer league? Cause that's kind of been the big thing is, Oh, it's only summer league. But like you just laid out, there were a lot of guys who looked really good. How, how much do they, how much are the Kings as their own organization taking away from those five games? You know, I think you have to, if you show up and you just look horrible, that's an issue. Like, especially for a second year guy, even I'll say this too, like Chemezi, I wrote on this earlier today, Chemezi Metu had a disaster of, of a summer league as well. Mm. Like even before he punched somebody in the face, like he shot like 31% from the field. He shot 26% from the three point line. And he does, he didn't rebound that well. I think he averaged 10 points, 6.8 rebounds. Like that's a fourth year guy. Like you get to summer league as a fourth year guy, you better show up and show up big. Like that's the point of this exercise is to show that you've gotten better. You've gotten better. And then once you get to a certain stage, you just understand how to play the game well enough that you walk on the floor and you're so much better than some of the guys, like the steward guy that uh, the Kings had on the roster. I just, every time they put him on the court, it was like, oh my gosh, what is happening? Like that is what summer league looks like. Some guys do not know how to play the game yet at all. And then a guy in his fourth year, he should know how to play the game. He should walk in and, you know, a double double would have been expected, you know, shooting 48% from the field should have been, you know, like expected shooting 35 to 40% from three. That's what I expected out of Chemezi. I just thought it was a bit of a disaster, but um, I don't think that it's going to impact him going into, you know, it doesn't change his lot in life, but what it does do it, it opens the door for guys, uh, like what was it? Matt Coleman, um, the kid out of Texas who I thought came in and played, he, he's almost like he Brett Saberhagen, except Saberhagen it, he played well every other game. Um, and that's not going to work. So like Saberhagen was good every other year as a pitcher and, you know, it's like Cy Young and then horrible and then Cy and then horrible. Um, but the point that I'm making is that like he showed up in a couple of games that it was like, okay, I got you. Uh, you're, you can be my starting point guard uh, for the Stockton Kings next season. So what you do is you give those guys an invite to training camp. And if they're one of the final three players that are cut, you can allocate them to your, your G league squad if they choose to go there. And so those are things where like, I think guys can actually make an impactful, uh, like stand for themselves. Like Lou King played extremely well. Uh, you know, I think Mimias Keda, he played well enough that you saw the outline, but you also saw that by game four and game five, his body was hurting and he mm. was falling apart. And that just shows you, okay, what do I need to do with him? I need to get him in the gym and work him out really hard and get him ready but maybe two years from now, he can be my Alex Lynn. You know, he can be that guy who comes in and punishes people and, and block shots and and rebounds at a high clip. So I think you can, you see outlines, you see outlines of players. Um, but again, you know, I think it was Dante Green scored like 42 points in his first summer league game yeah. when he was with the Houston Rockets before the transaction happened that traded him to the Sacramento Kings. Um, which was already in the works, but they let him play in summer league for Houston. And so sometimes guys can do something that are just like crazy, you know, like a guy like Cam Thomas, I think Cam Thomas is going to score in the NBA. He's not going to have any problems. He's not going to put up 27 a game. I don't think, but the fact that he walked in the door and was that good, that's kind of what you expected from a guy who all he does is score. Um, but yeah, I, I think you can learn some. And I think more than anything else, you can learn, who really isn't ready and who isn't going to be a ball player or is got a long road in front of them. James Ham is always ready. Kings insider and sports aficionado with us here on Dilo and KC on ESPN 1320. You mentioned the Stockton Kings. I think there's a couple of things worth pointing out there and a couple of things worth asking one, how many of these guys that we saw in the summer league, do you think Bobby's going to be coaching uh, when the Stockton Kings G league season rolls around? Well, he's certainly going to have Ramsey, which I thought, again, Ramsey started out uh, at the Cal Classic was like, oh, boy. You cringed. Like, you yeah. cringed the day after. <laughs> yeah, you cringed big time. Um, but then, you know, he turned it around. And his speed and quickness getting down the court, his defensive intensity, he played, I thought he played really well position defense. I actually thought that that was one of the players where you looked at him and you thought, oh, man, 
did Doug Christie already talk to him? Did he already work with him a little bit? Mm. That was one of those situations where like, I don't want to give, take away any of the credit of what Ramsey's done and what the people around him have done, but there was something different about the way he moved. And I thought, all right, that's, that's nice to see. He's only 20 years old. So I think he'll be down in, uh, in Stockton. Um, again, I, I think Coleman has a chance to be in Stockton just depends on if he gets better offers. Um, I think that, uh, the Woodard, if he, if he is held on to just certainly will be in Stockton the entire season, uh, trying to get ready. And I think Kata is going to spend the entire season. I mean, the Kings have like 14 big men that can play the center position at this point. Like, and so there's just, I don't think there's any way he's going to see any meaningful time in Sacramento this year. So I think there's plenty. Uh, and again, a guy like Emmanuel Terry, if you can somehow get him to Stockton, but you know, he got a taste for playing in Europe last year. He played in Israel, played in a couple other places, I believe. And you know, you start getting paychecks when you do that. Mm -hmm. And so getting him back in the only way you're really going to get him to be on a, a team during this, during the G league season is to get him onto a two-way contract where he's making, you know, the, the 400 K a year. Can it, I want to go back to the last summer league championship the Kings won. Mm -hmm. What happened that they win that summer league title and then didn't make the postseason? It wasn't the start of something. It was just a random summer league championship. How do they avoid doing that again? Like, why is this different? Well, uh, to be honest with you, there's no correlation between summer league and what happens in the regular season. Sure. Like, I, I mean, this is, this is fun. It, we had a good time watching it. I had a good time tweeting about it. Um, but this is summer league. I mean, most of these guys, I mean, even if you look at the stack of guys that were there that are actually on the roster. And again, the Kings have four guys, I think is it four uh, between it, Davion, Jemias, Robert Woodard, and uh, there. Oh, and Chemezi who were all on the main roster of the 15, uh, the 15 man main roster. So, so the Kings will have some guys that that show up and play, but of that group, Davion is the only one who's guaranteed like substantial time. He's the mm -hmm. only guy that you just pencil in and go, all right, is he going to play 20 to 24? Is he going to play like 22 to 26, 24 to 28? What is he going to play? I'm not sure. Like we'll see as the season progresses, progresses but he's the only guy that you're like, okay, he's going to be there. And then you take him and you have, he's 22 years old and you put him on a team filled with guys who have been prof professionals for, you know, some of these guys, nine or 10 years and Harrison Barnes and Mo Harkless. And, you know, things change. He's going to be like, he won't be the voice that he is there. Maybe two years from now, he'll be the voice that he, he was in summer league. He can be that behind the scenes a little bit. Um, but like, I, I just don't think that there's a huge transition between what summer league is and, and what the the main roster is and then if i'm not mistaken wasn't the last time they made uh they won this the summer league championship that's like ray uh uh ray mccallum and ben mclemore right but then that team was off to a decent start and then things the wheels fell off the bus that year mm -hmm. and they started firing people and doing all that stuff um that was avoidable i mean again summer league thing was one thing and positive that what happened next was was nefarious and ridiculousness by certain people in the in the organization. We had this conversation earlier, and is and we, you saw we talked about tweeting and the reaction to the summer league championship, and you know we'll dive further into Bobby. But is Bobby Jackson the most beloved king of all time? Great question. He might be. You know. I'll, I'll tell you, like I I wrote when I first started doing this, I, I wrote an article searching for Bobby Jackson, sort of like searching for Bobby Fisher, um, because I thought that Jeff Petrie spent his last like five or six, maybe even ten years searching for another Bobby Jackson, mm -hmm. and never could find that player. You know, guys like Quincy Duby, and he just kept bringing in guys who he thought would have that type of impact. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think Chris Weber is is beloved. Uh, Mike Bibby, Jason Williams. I mean, Vlade and Peja before they became part of the front office. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that whole group, even Scott Pollard, Scott Pollard is beloved. So I, I think there is, like, there's such a connection to that whole group of players. Um, but, like, I, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. Like, 
it's it's not often you see a guy come in who again like i didn't know what his x's and o's would be there's no time to teach x's and o's uh, i know that luke was there doing some some work with the group as well and you know a lot of assistants were there but at the end of the day like either you follow a guy or you don't mm -hmm. right that, that's kind of like i've always said like the second a guy loses the room is the second he has to go like George Carl got to keep his job for about six months longer than he should have because he had completely lost the room. He lost the room like in December. If he even had the room at any point, he lost it like in December. Um, so, and you know, George is a great coach, but in Sacramento, whatever happened, happened and he lost the room. I, you know, there was a point where I think Keith Smart lost the room. There was a point where of course DeMarcus Cousins and uh, Paul Westfall had this moment and there was no coming back from it for one of them. And, you know, you got a young superstar player and, and a, and a coach that wasn't paid a ton of money because that's the way the, the Moose ran the business. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, I, 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 I'm super impressed with what Bobby did, whether he's most beloved King, you know, again, I think there's a lot of them, you know, I, you, people forget how much they loved Pete Chilcutt, <laughs> you know, uh, guys like Michael, the animal Smith were beloved. Yeah. Uh, you know, Mitch Richmond was beloved, uh, but also Spud Webb and, and Walt Williams were beloved. I mean, like this community has a way of loving their players and their, you know, and it doesn't have to be the star, which I think maybe that's why Bobby does have some of that appeal because he wasn't the star. He was one of a collection of really good players. Well, I, I think about like if I were to make a, a list, I, like we, we were talking about this earlier and I zeroed in on Bobby, Doug, and, and Jay will all have very, I think, unique histories with the organization. Of course, Doug coming back, Bobby coming back. You know, Bobby was only here six years. Bobby started yeah. like 40 something games in his career in Sacramento. You know, Doug had a short time here. And I know they're part of the most romanticized time of this organization. Jay will, you know, preceded that. No, no Kings highlight is complete unless you've got three or four you know, mm -hmm. Jay will passes in it. So I feel like I kept centering on those guys. DeMarcus is such a unique character in King's history, but watching the reaction to Bobby Jackson winning a, a five game summer league last night, I just thought, and maybe that's more indicative of the fan base yeah. than it is anything else. But I just, I was like, God, this Bobby is such a special fixture here. Yeah. And always has been because of the way that he played. I agree, but I'll also tell you that the fans love Isaiah Thomas in that same That's way. That's very true. You know, very, very that true. same way. But again, like yep. a guy like Isaiah, while he was, he's only here three years. Um, and again, that was a catastrophic miscalculation of understanding of basketball talent and everything else, why he, he didn't stick with Sacramento. Um, but like he showed up to city council meetings while the team was trying to, while the owners were trying to relocate to the, like other cities but yeah. he showed up and was there to support the fan base not to you know stand for for seattle where he's you know raised you know so like again like i think there are a lot of people like they don't get it like when guys come to sacramento they a lot of them come back a lot of them live here i mean you can still see kenny thomas I ran into Kenny Thomas at the Nevada County fair like 10 years ago mm -hmm. like it's just random these guys are you know harold presley they're this community has a way of absorbing people and making them feel so welcome that they don't end up wanting to leave. And so I think that there are a lot of players that feel that way. And there's a lot of fans that feel that way towards specific players, you know, each of them, so many fans have had, because it's such a small city, they've had interactions with players that, that were different. I mean, when I was in high school, like Michael Jackson, like the King's guard, not the, not the hip hop artist, showed up at my high school and like for some events and i think it was him and harold presley i mean those you remember those guys you know even when they're gone a, a year later or two years later so i think it, it's kind of indicative of sacramento community michael jackson the hip-hop artist that's a that is definitely a james ham line right there. yeah Absolutely. well michael jackson 100%. whatever you want to call it, i don't know what you know like pop pop, I, I, no, no, pop. pop. yeah pop yeah the king of pop yeah yeah uh yeah Again, I, I know Michael Jackson better than I know the other group. Like <laughs> anything past like 1985, awesome. probably. But uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you guys know what I mean. I love James Ham.
Yeah. I swear. For moments. This is why we do this is for moments like this. Yeah. I want to I want to spin off the Bobby Jackson thing a little bit. You mentioned coaches still having the room. Does Luke Walton still have the room? Yes. And that's why I, I keep telling people like Luke has a room. The players want him to be the coach. So if they want him to be the coach and they have faith in him, maybe the fan base should get behind it until it's time you know, to go. And, you know, every coach has its time, you know, Greg Popovich won't coach in San Antonio forever. Like there is going to come a moment for everybody where it just doesn't work out anymore or, or you, you just can't do it anymore. Uh, but yeah, I, I think he does. Um, like I at least think he deserves another year. And like, we've talked about this a bunch. I just like two seventy two game seasons completely marred by, by a, a global virus. That's a pandemic that's wiping out millions of people. I mean, you just have to at some point go, okay, look, have we rushed to judgment? Was this team really as good as everyone thought they might be? The answer is no. Dave Yeager will tell you they, this team was not great at the end of the season, his final year, um, and that needed a lot of work. Um, but, you know, I I think he still has room. And, you know, again, Bobby, I, I think, just captured the the imagination of his players in, in some way. And they followed him into, into battle, every single one of them. I thought that was absolutely impressive. Very much so. Luke um, used to tell you and, and other members of the media uh, that he he would want his he want he he wants to have a defensive intensity that leads to the team running on offense. He wants mm-hmm. their ability to run on the offensive end to be created by their defense. We've seen Monty Williams do that with the Phoenix Suns. We've seen them increase their defensive intensity and be able to run on the offensive end. Luke has wanted to do this for years, but has never actually been able to do it. Does he finally have the roster that could potentially implement that game plan that he wanted to do two years ago? Yeah. I I mean, I I don't think he has, I mean, he has like an up and coming star in De'Aaron Fox, but outside of that, you've got a a bunch of really solid NBA players. There's not another star level player. And you hope that Davion can be a star level defender and, and, you hope that Mo Harkless and Alex Len and you know even if Tristan Thompson plays much like that's a player that can help you defensively. I think Terrence Davis can help you defensively. I think all of those players in combination can rise. It can raise up the value of a De'Aaron Fox's defense, of a Harrison Barnes defense. So you're hoping for like a collective raising itself together um, by adding a few of the right components. Um, but you know, also you brought up Monty Williams, like. He, Monty Williams, his team shouldn't even have made the bubble last year. They were horrible for the first 65 games of the year, whatever it was, like 62 games. They shouldn't have made it to the bubble. And you bring in like a Jay Crowder and you bring in a Chris Paul and the intellect of the team rises by so much. The sort of defensive acumen, the offensive acumen, all those things rise just by adding two or three like key components that can happen quickly with a team. So I don't know that the Kings can make it to the Western conference finals or the NBA finals, like what we saw out of Monty Williams group. But at the same time, like there is no science to this, you know, good teams usually are good for, you know, six to eight year window and then they fade and, and, you know, great teams somehow find a way to extend it out and they keep making the right moves. Um, And then teams like the Kings just figure out ways to, fail every single time they get to a point where they shouldn't, you know, again, going back to the summer league team and, you know, Michael Malone would have had this team in the playoffs. I think if Dave Yeager was a coach the next year, Dave Yeager would have had this team in the playoffs. We didn't have to get to 15 years. It was avoidable the whole time. Just no one was willing to say, let's stay the course and not veer off. And so, you know, again, I, I think that there, there's a lot you can put into what we saw out of a team like the Suns this year, but that can happen to a lot of different teams. It just, it, it's a matter of guys maturing at the right time of putting the right veterans around them, of finding the right mixture, having a coach that has the right vision and right, you know, idea for the season. And you just don't know. Are you uh, sorry, Kyle? One, one second. I, I don't want every, everything you said hundred percent accurate, but I, I don't want to discount 
the reason the Suns weren't invited to the bubble was because they needed an even number of teams like that. Like that's it. It's not like they earned their place there. And you could look across the league. I think the Washington Wizards were the team on the Eastern Conference. And but it was during that eight game stretch. And I think you could date back. And I, I and I understand, Jane, this is a tiny sample size to, you know, maybe the four games before the bubble. Still a really bad team. It was in the bubble that they had a top defensive rating team and a top offensive rating team. This was before Chris Paul and Jay Crowder. Like this was something they, this is something that I, I I think, and maybe this is naive of me that actually attracted Chris Paul to the Phoenix Suns. And, 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 and I understand you can't put too much into that bubble because they were essentially for very, you know, with the exception of very, very few teams, they were virtually exhibition games. Yeah. And, and I mean, they went eight and and didn't make, didn't make the plan. But right. I'll just tell you, like right. the bubble, the bubble concept itself completely changed the direction of two franchises. I mean, two that uh, without even looking any other anywhere past the conversation we're having right now. Yep. Like if if the Phoenix Suns didn't win those eight games, like there's always going to be a connection between Monty Williams and and Chris Paul. So mm-hmm. that could have happened either way. But the confidence they built in that bubble, the way things went in that bubble, you know, that played into how they started this last season. On the flip side, if the Kings never went to that bubble yeah. at all, number one, if there wasn't a bubble, if the season would have played out, the Kings would have made the playoffs or, or they would have been really, really, really close. I mean, they had, I think it was 17 games there trailing by three and a half and Memphis had like the most ridiculous Memphis schedule. Ever, yeah. Right. Memphis had no shot. The Kings had the best shot of anybody. This, the um, Portland Trailblazers, I was in Portland right before the bubble happened. I mean, right before the shutdown happened. That team was shot. They were yep. absolutely done. They had quit and they were ready to go home. So that whole entire situation. But the other point is that by having the bubble, Vlade mm-hmm. Divac got fired. Because yeah. of that eight-game bubble, Vlade got fired. Bogdanovich didn't get retained. Bazemore didn't get retained. Len didn't get retained. If this team walked into this se- if the same team walked into this season and you added a Halliburton in the draft, like is that are we talking about a 15 year playoff drought still? Maybe, maybe mm. not. But still, I, I'll tell you that Luke Walton would have won more games would, than would, than the 31. Would Vlade have drafted Tyrese though? Maybe, maybe not. But <laughs> would he have found someone else? I mean, would would yeah, there have been I, someone else? You know, yeah. I, you know, again, would it could Devin Vassell had fallen to him? I, I like that's a big what if, but. Sure. At the same time, I think if you just look at the bubble itself, the whole concept of it, mm-hmm. it changed the direction of, of two franchises yep. without even going any further than those two. So it sounds like to me you're picking the Kings to go to the finals. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> uh, from Summer League final uh, champions to like NBA. No. Um, like, it's a hell of a year for Davion Mitchell. I don't think that's ever happened. <laughs> yeah. Like, look, I would be uh, like, I would be surprised if they're not in the running, at least for a playoff spot. Yeah, I think that they've added a lot of depth and people can say, well, they didn't swing for, they didn't hit the home run. It's like, well, maybe they did. And maybe Halliburton improves by five or six points per game. Maybe De'Aaron Fox is the same player he is for 82 games instead of, you know, 55 because he's just that much better and bigger and stronger. And so, I mean, I think there's plenty of room for this team to improve without even bringing in the big heavy hitter from the outside. Do you think De'Aaron could score even more than he did last year? And and have it be healthy? Probably not. Mm. Like, uh, do I think he can score 27 a game, 28 a game? Sure. But are you going to win if that's the case? I mean, you have that's a fine line to walk. I mean, I'll tell you this. If he hit his free throws that, at a 10% at. higher clip, he would have scored 0. 0.7 points per game more, which would have put him above, like, Trey Young and Devin Booker in the scoring race. Mm. So, I mean – like that that's how much his free throw shooting cost him so yeah i I think he can be better but like i don't know like if De'Aaron fox is going 30 a night i don't know that you're that that's the right thing for the team i don't know how good the team will be if that's the case maybe i'm wrong but you know like kind of the bradley bill effect like that team struggles to win and he puts up all these numbers but like there's a, a balancing point where he can be so impactful and be for himself and so impactful for his team. And I think taking a lot of defensive responsibilities off of him are good. I think adding mm-hmm. a guy who can bring the ball up every single time and Halbert next to him is spectacular and will take some of that stress off of him. 
I think having a Davion Mitchell around will do the same thing. So I, I think a lot of these moves actually help the the final project, what we'll see from De'Aaron Fox. Can the Kings win a championship as long as De'Aaron Fox is their best player? I, I mean, maybe. We're going to have to see how good De'Aaron Fox is when he's at his peak because he's 23 years old until he's right. 25, um, 26. Then I'm not going to say no. I mean, what did it take Michael Jordan eight years to win a championship? Right. Yeah. Like, so we're, we're ready to judge De'Aaron after four and say whether he's the number one option or not. Um, and I'm not saying Michael, Michael Jordan was the number one option, you know, the day he stepped foot in the gym in Chicago. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, we're going to have to wait and see. Like, is De'Aaron a, a prototypical, like, number one? I, I'm not ready to say that yet. He's a 1A or a 1B for sure right now. But... Again, he's 23 years old. Right. Let let's see where he ends up. Let's not let's not make that commitment now because again, I Steph Curry after four seasons, um, Russ Westbrook after uh, like Russell Westbrook and him pace almost identical for the first four years of their career. So I, I want to see what De'Aaron is at 25. Triple doubles, baby. Triple doubles on the way uh, for De'Aaron Fox. James is oh, always boy. one of my favorite hours of the week, man. Thanks for hanging out with us. We appreciate you. Enjoy your vacation next week. I know uh, James said he was, he's 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 going to join us, but uh, <laughs> he's 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 going away. He's taking some time away, so much deserved, man. So uh, uh, enjoy that, and we'll talk to you next week. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, Go James. Go 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 Go